Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. This week, we conclude our three-part series with Chris Kimball. He talked about how to get Chris podcasted us first to discuss internet resources and library in-person resources. Last week, he talked about some of the techniques that are used once you get to a library or you're doing research online. This week, he's going to talk about how he recovered lost stories about the Civil Wars through his different types of uh, researching. Chris Kimball, hopefully not for the last time, we welcome you back to the Seminole Wars. Well, I'm glad to be here once again. Chris, remind our listeners, what is it that you find interesting about the history? We have a military museum in Carabelle, which is like many others, it's a World War II museum. People would donate their stuff if Grandpa passes away or something. And you see all this neat stuff and you wonder what they've been through and what their lives were like. And, you know, it's all this stuff that just doesn't make it in the history books. So, you know, you go into the letters and journals and find all that neat stuff. That's kind of what I'm looking at with all these letters and and little uh, nuggets of items. Our listeners know the story of Major Dade, at least it pees if he's the Seminole Wars, but there's a personal side to him that is often overlooked and, in fact, was overlooked. What's the story there? Okay. Major Dade, uh, of course, we... We know that his uh, wife and oldest daughter are buried in Pensacola. And, of course, on his oldest daughter's gravestone, it says Major Dade's only daughter. Well, I was looking at the letters that Major Dade was writing uh, before he uh, came down to Key West. And he wrote in a letter in, um, I think it's Fredericksburg, Virginia, said, my wife is sick after the recent death of my youngest child. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, if he has one daughter that lives past Hita, and he's calling it saying youngest child, there's somebody we're missing here. So I started to research the newspaper obituaries and, and find a grave and found out Major Dade had a daughter that we never knew about. Her name's Virginia Lawrenceetta Dade. And Virginia, of course, Major Dade's family is from Virginia. Lawrence Seta from the name Lawrence, Major Dade's brother was Lawrence. So you can see where he got the name from. And she died at 18 months old. She was born when Dade was up in recruiting, I think, in Albany, New York. And they came down. And when Major Dade and his wife uh, were in Fredericksburg, Virginia, then his, his daughter died. And she was buried in the local Episcopal Cemetery. It's an unmarked grave, but it's in the grave records. And it's on Find a Grave. So I found the lost daughter of Major Dade that we never knew about. Now, find a grave can get you, so to speak, in the ballpark, or in this case, in the cemetery. But if there's an unmarked grave or some other problems, you may actually have to go to the cemetery to find out more. What happened in this case? Once I found out that there might be an obituary, I called the uh, local library in Fredericksburg, and uh, one of the librarians uh, was kind enough to send me a copy of the obituary that said, daughter of Major Dade. Of course, at the time, there was only one Major Dade in the Army, and that was it. Chris, you're not done with the loose ends from Major Dade. There's another loose end. What's that? After the war, uh, this uh, 1843, I see a newspaper article is that uh, General Jessup's writing that he found the shotgun of Major Day, that he had gotten it from an Indian, and apparently it was something that everybody knew what it was. I don't know if it had Major Day's name carved in it or something, but um, General Jessup wants it to give it back to a male member of Day's family. Of course, Major Day doesn't have any surviving sons, so he puts the call out in the newspaper for any relatives. So Dade has a, it's like a second cousin. It's a Colonel John Dade, I believe his name is. 
uh, who was the superintendent of the penitentiary in Washington, D.C. And so he writes back, you know, saying he's the closest relative. And of course, it would probably be past one of his sons. Unfortunately, his son had just died. So he had a son-in-law who soon died after that. Kind of interesting coincidence is that Major Dade's brother, Lawrence, had uh, either recently died or he died a few months later after this newspaper article. So pretty much all the surviving dates of that line of family were suddenly passed away. But it's interesting that there was some daughters who married something like the grandson of John Dade, married like a granddaughter of uh, John T. Sprague. And so we don't know what happened to the shotgun or where it went, but it'd be kind of interesting if it passed through the hands of the descendants of John T. Sprague, who wrote the history of the Second Seminole War in 1848. In fact, he had like a great-great-grandson who passed away in Fort Lauderdale not long ago. If, if I had known that before he passed away, I would have written him and asked him if he knew anything about the Major Day shotgun. <laughs> To, to make it even more interesting, in uh, the Dade family, uh, many of the surviving members went out to Kentucky, I think it was Hopkinsville, Kentucky, in western Kentucky, uh, not far from Paducah. Uh, I was looking through the genealogy and found a Dade family member with the first name of Osceola, born in 1868 and died in 1965. And buried in Missouri. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's interesting that we have a Dade family member who was named after Osceola. Of course, no relation. Uh, Osceola was actually a celebrity's name, and I've run into people who named their son or child Osceola <laughs> in some uh, genealogy records. But what's interesting, as I told this to another Dade relative, a uh, retired colonel in the Air Force, and his last name stayed. And he, he's descended from the dates that settled in Hopkinsville. So he said he was going to get his daughter, who's going to college, just a few miles away from that cemetery, see if she could get a photograph of it. On the subject of Osceola, his final physician, Dr. Frederick Vieden, was at Fort Moultrie with him when he died. This is Charleston, South Carolina. What can you tell us about Dr. Whedon? and his peculiar practices. Dr. Whedon is famous when Osceola died against Osceola's wishes. He took his possessions and also removed Osceola's head for his collection of medical specimens. Looking in the Indian uh, Affairs Department papers, it turns out that Dr. Whedon was the cheapest doctor that money could buy at that time, that he was paid $150 a month or 50 cents for each of the Seminole prisoners at Fort Moultrie. And the uh, papers say that we could not find a doctor uh, for this low a price other than Dr. Ween. So he's the cheapest <laughs> that the Army could find. So if you want to blame him for anything else, uh, you could do it, do that as well. Osceola is not the only famous Indian for these parts. Besides a Seminole, there's Millie Francis, a Creek. Tell us about Millie Francis. Millie Francis was given a Congressional Medal, which uh, came in right at her deathbed. It was brought to her by Ethan Allen Hitchcock. And uh, she had a husband who was with the Creek Regiment in uh, Florida. The Creek Indians sent 759 warriors to fight against the Seminoles on the side of the United States. And her husband at the time had died during the time in Florida. But another person in the Creek Regiment who died was that we know as David Moniak. And of course, he's been the subject of an earlier podcast uh, with the research by uh, Richard Allen. And supposedly, David Moniak married the cousin of Osceola. You know, it's a very small world back then. Uh, a lot fewer people that run across each other uh, have their brush of fame with each other. Speaking of brushes with frame, or more appropriately, brushes with death. Tell us about the officers and soldiers who served with Major Dade did not accompany him the full route on his fateful march. 
Lieutenant Ben Alvert, he was with Major Dade's command when they marched out of Fort Brooke, and he is a young lieutenant at the time, and he uh, marched with Major Dade until Captain Gardner came up. Uh, the cannon got stuck, and they sent some horses back uh, to Fort Brooke to, I guess, get some horses or cattle and uh, help them retrieve the ca- cannon. And Captain Gardner returned to Dade's command at that same time. And so they had an extra officer. So they sent Lieutenant Alford back to Fort Brooke. And he actually survived Major Dade's command. And incidentally, he's not the only one that survived. But supposedly, uh, Captain Gardner's wife and daughter took up, I guess, residence with Lieutenant Alford, not in a worldly way, as we might say. Uh, but more as a support system, because back then it was rare for widows and orphans to have pensions. So apparently for a while, Alfred supported Captain Gardner's uh, wife and daughter after Gardner was killed. The two families did have some ties to Key West. That made them familiar to each other. Right. And uh, Alfred, he goes, he's sent back to Key West to to basically close up the military affairs at the post. Uh, They uh, closed down the barrack and he had the responsibility for closing the books on that and having the property sent elsewhere to the quartermaster department or whatever. Let's move on to our next curiosity. Lieutenant Scott, Fort Scott, and the one-time adjutant who kept Lieutenant Scott's commission for more than three decades. Yes, well, uh, Lieutenant Scott, um, a young officer in the Army at the time, and we're talking about right after the War of 1812 was over, he was uh, promoted, I think, as first lieutenant in 1815. So he was charged with bringing up the barges of supplies that were being brought in from Mobile up the Apalachicola River to Fort Scott. And it was very slow going because near Mobile, he had to avoid pirates. And then the tides and the current were going the wrong way. So he was a few weeks behind. When he was just within a mile or two of Fort Scott coming up the Apalachicola River, and apparently it was night, the wind blew the barges into the side of the river because it was a turn. The Indians pounced on him, mainly as revenge because a week before the army burned Fowltown. And so Lieutenant Scott and most of the men on board and some of the women supposedly some of the children that were coming up to Fort Scott. All of them were killed except for six who could swim and jump the ship and were able to escape there. So there's about 40 that were on the boat. And so, you know, 30, 36 or 37 soldiers were killed. But, you know, that's not the end of the story for Lieutenant Scott, even though he was among that was killed. It was during the 200th anniversary of our remembering the Fort Scott uh, incident is that on I, believe, I think it was uh, auction site it might have been Sotheby's or somewhere else there was the commission certificate each time an officer is promoted or uh, when they become an officer they receive a nice certificate signed by the president that says your commission second lieutenant or first lieutenant well lieutenant Scott's commission certificate shows up on auction and on the back is a note written by uh, Colonel Twiggs. Now, going back time to Fort Scott in 1817, when this happened, Major David Twiggs was the adjutant at Fort Scott. He was in the 4th Infantry at that time. So when somebody got killed, it was his duty to forward the uh, personal effects back to the family, if the family could be found. So on the back is written, you know, Twiggs's signature and Fort Reed in January 1841. And I can recognize that handwriting. You wrote that was Twiggs adjutant of in 1841. Twiggs is now the second in command of the second dragoons in Florida, headquartered at Fort Reed, uh, which is now Sanford, Florida, a mile from Fort Mellon. And the adjutant's handwriting, I recognize that as uh, uh, Major Ashby. And he, he eventually later that year resigned from the Army and became a lawyer in Charleston. Twiggs wrote on there the date of, of, you know, or at least signed it and then the date and Ashby's handwriting. So for some reason, the commission ended up in the desk of Colonel Twiggs now for 25 years. <laughs> so talk about somebody not cleaning out their desk and something that should have been sent to the family. 
it's a mystery to us why this was remaining in Twig's uh, paperwork for 25 years. Because of your insatiable curiosity, Chris, you had to look at the back to see what else might be there. And you found out some very important information. Usually people don't turn over the back to see what's penciled in on back, but I just happened to recognize this because I was uh, reading other documents involving the same characters. When was this auction and what was the exact nature of it again? Yeah, th this is 2017 and this is just a historical paperwork document that's being auctioned that came from somewhere that uh, we don't know where it was from 1841 to 2017. So, you know, 175 years that it just was floating around somewhere and ended up on auction. Yeah, it's really strange. History strange. Maybe they couldn't find any surviving family members of Lieutenant Scott. There were other deaths to go around, certainly in the Second Seminole War. Tell us about Colonel John Lane. Colonel John Lane, he was a young lieutenant, and this was right before the Second Seminole War in 1835. And I'll explain a minute how he got from lieutenant to colonel in only a year. <laughs> it's that he was in Washington, and his father was a congressman and wronged or besmirched by another congressman. So Lieutenant John Lane, he's going through, through a pub or something in Washington and sees the other offending party, and they get in an argument. and uh, Lane ends up caning him and g giving him a good thrashing. Uh, so there's a court martial. Uh, the congressman wants to uh, indict Lane, and uh, Lane gets off the hook uh, because congressmen at the time is determined that they should not have the power to call out a member of the military for prosecution whenever they feel like it. And it said that apparently the congressman took the, the first uh, stab at it and literally stabbed as a knife, and, and I guess Lane did get cut. Um, but anyway, Lane gets the attention of President Andrew Jackson. So Andrew Jackson, he's somebody who really likes somebody who takes up chivalry and bravery. So Colonel John Lane, he's a protege of... <laughs> Uh, of Jackson. So when the Creek Regiment organizes again, he b is made a colonel of the Creek Regiment. So that kind of a temporary promotion, I believe he was in the 1st Dragoon Regiment. And another of the Dragoon members was Lieutenant Izzard, who was shot and killed at the Withlacoochee right before the Battle of Gaines. Uh, so you have these two Dragoon officers, and Colonel Lane, he apparently goes mad at Fort Drain and has the fever and drives the sword through his head. It goes insane. You know, they always say, well, it was just driven mad from the condition and all that. Fell on his sword, literally. <laughs> and so uh, David Moniak is uh, Native American, uh, the next ranking up for that, although they can't have the Indians commanding themselves. So they eventually, I think, Colonel Pierce is later put in command. Anyway, the Army, John Lane, who he had invented a pontoon bridge, uh, taking a inflatable pontoon of India rubber, you know, putting it over a creek or a river and making a bridge. And that was not a new concept. It's just he streamlined it and made it so that everything could be carried in one wagon. And so that made it very efficient for bringing over the Florida territory. There was a debate for a long time who invented the modern pontoon bridge. Was it the British or Colonel Lane? And the pontoon bridge, one of the places it was deployed was on the Okawaha River by Fort Fowles. So soldiers going from Fort King, heading, uh, I think it's east over the Okawaha River and take the bridge out of the wagon and blow it up and inflate it and then walk across. And when they're done, they pack it all up, and take it with them <laughs> there. So, you know, not, not only does the fort guard the bridge, but, you know, when they're done with the bridge, they just pull it up and pack it away. So John Lane may get some credit for coming up with the modern pontoon bridge, or at least how to carry it and move it. There's another soldier, an officer, Gabriel Rains, who was also an innovator with military technology. Tell us about Gabriel Rains. Right. Gabriel Rains, he's famous as the father of the landmine in, in the submersible version in the water. They called him torpedoes. He used them effectively in the Civil War 
but in the second Seminole War, he was testing them out on the Seminoles. And I wrote about this in the book, Alachua Ambush. Just to make the story a little shorter, is that uh, he set up a booby trap about a mile outside Fort King. And one of the Seminole warriors got caught up into it and killed. And so when his soldiers came out the next day, they were ambushed by about 100 Seminoles and had to do hand-to-hand fighting uh, back to Fort King. When did this happen? That was uh, 1840. That was uh, April 28th, 1840. Gabriel Rain's courses, landmines or submersible uh, torpedoes. Those were famous uh, 20 years later in the Civil War. Rains's torpedo in Rains's torpedoes in Mobile Bay led Admiral Farragut to utter a famous command. What was that all about? Yes, uh, well, I worked at Fort Morgan, so I know a little bit about when the uh, Union blockade fleet was coming through the past the Mobile Point, past Fort Morgan. The area was mined with what the torpedoes. And they call them torpedoes because when the ship goes by, there's a chain in the water and the ship's hull pulls on the chain and makes the torpedo slam against the ship and they explode. And so they they actually do move in the water, but they're made to move by the ship that rams in. But the story goes, the Union Admiral, David Farragut, when warned about the torpedoes in Mobile Bay, said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. What do we know about that? We heard. Maybe Farragut didn't say that, but he died soon afterwards. They never contested it or said anything about it anyway. But we're thinking they may have said, damn, torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> Interesting is that at Mobile Bay, they lost the USS Tecumseh, which is still there in the water. It's uh, considered a grace of the naval sailors who went down with it. That's the only ship they lost in the battle. It was a monitor-class ironclad. And uh, interesting, it's about uh, Gabriel Rain near Fort King. It was about 17 or 18 soldiers against 100 Seminoles, and they fought their way out pretty much hand-to-hand combat. And the only reason why they didn't get wiped out like Major Dade is Major Gabriel Rains. He survived, I think, because they did straight infantry fighting and tactics. And that uh, proved to be the thing to do to break out of the uh, situation where they were surrounded. Tell us about Colonel Parrish. The Army exonerated him for his lethal actions, but that did not settle the dispute that led to the altercation, at least for other family members involved. Yes, early in the war, there was a, uh, the Florida militia was at Fort Drain and commanded by Colonel Richard Parrish from Tallahassee. And he ordered Lieutenant William Ward to be the officer of the guard. Ward didn't want to do that because apparently he had just come off duty and didn't want to go on duty again. So he argued against it and pulled the pistols and said that anybody who tries to make him do our duty again or officer of the guard and then he, he was going to shoot him <laughs> and but uh colonel parrish ordered lieutenant ward arrested nobody would do it they didn't want to approach him so colonel parrish gets his shotgun walks up and shoots lieutenant ward dead that actually starts a series of duels <laughs> there and uh ward's brother is george ward and he's a famous plantation owner in tallahassee George Ward actually marries the uh, most eligible uh, debutante, uh, the uh, daughter of Benjamin Chairs, who's the richest plantation owner in Tallahassee. So George Ward, his brother, challenges Parrish's uh, lieutenant, or I guess XO, Augustus Alston, to a duel. And they do this duel stuff to uphold honor. But where is the honor in Ward disobeying a lawful order from a superior officer? There is no honor in that. Parrish does what he's supposed to do as a commander to enforce his orders and discipline. If Ward can do this, any troop can do this. And then all manner of discipline will collapse. So the army exonerated Parrish, but that wasn't enough for the family of Ward who felt like somehow in his official capacity and duties, he was at fault. And so this death had to be avenged. That's a skewed way of looking at honor. Alston is supposed to be the winning, (laughs) uh, I guess the winning duelist in the matter. But anyway, they get in a duel and 
it's re- real bloody, and it turns out they both have so such a loss of blood that they pass out. So they decide to reschedule at a later date. Well, uh, George Ward, uh, he doesn't get that opportunity. He survives, and I think he's killed in the Battle of Chancellorville or one of the battles up in Virginia in 1862. This is uh, now, this is about 1839. In the meantime, Augustus Alston challenges a duel with um, General uh, Lee Reed. Lee Reed is the, uh, he or he was the uh, second in command of the Florida militia, uh, and and his uh, brigade commander was Richard Parrish. Lee Reed gets in a duel with Augustus Alston. Alston's supposed to be the winning duelist, and uh, Lee Reed is supposed to, uh, the odds were against him because he was wounded at the Battle of Withlacoochee. He couldn't handle a gun very well. So Alston makes the terms of the duel and decides that it's going to be Jaeger rifles at 50 paces or 50 yards. Or Actually, I think it's closer than that. But Alston, when he's turning around, he misfires. So he uses up his shot. So Lee Reed takes careful aim and kills Augustus Alston. Well, and, and another example of brothers in the blood feud is Alston's wife uh, is supposedly digs the bullet out of the body of her dead husband and gives it to Alston's brother, uh, Willis Alston, and says, use this bullet to kill Lee Reed. <laughs> In our podcast with Ben DiBiase from the Florida Historical Society, he mentions that they have the two dueling pistols in their collection. Anyway, what happens is Augustus Alston, he has an attempt where he tries to shoot Lee Reed, but Lee Reed survives. And then he tries again later on when Lee Reed's coming out of a hotel in Tallahassee, gets out his Bowie knife and cuts him like a trout and runs out to Texas. So uh, Willis Halston, he's on the run after killing who was then the Speaker of the House in charge of the Florida militia (laughs) there. Willis Halston, he goes to a town in Texas and meets friends of Lee Reed. He gets in an argument with them and ends up shooting and killing one of them. It turns out that one of the friends of Lee Reed that he killed was the town surgeon. Well, in Texas, you don't want to kill the town surgeon on the frontier. So a posse gets together and gives Will Salston a prescription of lead of their own. (laughs) And so that's the end of him. In all these series of duels of all these people involved, every one of them dies a violent death, except for Colonel Richard Parrish, who dies of sickness and he's buried on the, where the family plantation was and, uh, by Lake Miccosukee, east of Tallahassee. The uh, Army exonerated Richard Parrish. They had a court-martial after the killing of Lieutenant Ward and said that Lieutenant Ward was disobeying a lawful order. So <laughs> Colonel Parrish was in every right uh, to uh, <laughs> shoot him down. Were these all territorial militiamen, or was there an active duty or regular Army component to this? This was territorial militia officers, but the court-martial was actually held by regular army officers because they were under the command overall of, uh, I believe it was uh, General Clinch, and they were at Fort Drain, which, you know, was, of course, the headquarters of General Clinch. So, happy ending for Colonel Parrish. The army upholds and exonerates his actions, or not? The story goes after Colonel Parrish kills Ward and gets off on the court-martial that the rest of the Florida militia around Fort Drain from Tallahassee, who Ward is rather well-liked because, you know, he's their generation more. They just pack up and go home. Now, Colonel Parrish, a few months later, when he has to recruit another brigade, that he's not able to do it because everybody's hostile to him for killing William Ward. So he ends up sending his uh, resignation. In fact, he sends it to his friend, President Andrew Jackson, and which is accepted. So he resigns his commission probably just a few months later after that happened. Then he died about three years later of natural causes. <laughs> Chris, this whole episode and all of its serials would make a heck of a great novel and probably show well on the screen, too. And writers would research the type of things that you found, Chris, because those add color and credibility to the 
era that one is painting when one's writing a novel. We would hope the novelist would keep as close to the historical record as possible, but this may not always happen. I am curious as to why people liked William Ward so much. There is a heck of a backstory there uh, to describe this guy and why uh, his sudden death provoked such outrage among people. We don't know. That's where a novelist or a historian could piece all this together using the techniques that you've talked about, Chris, in the previous two podcasts to get to where you have the type of information to tell a really good story as close as possible without need for any exaggeration because this story has plenty of that all on its own. As you note, Chris, Colonel Parrish was the only one in this whole sordid mess to actually survive it and then die peacefully in his sleep. Life was either very highly valued, hence the need for maintaining one's honor in dueling, or pretty cheap. Tell us about Captain Fulton and what he wrote about as far as telling us that life was considered fairly cheap back then. Yes, uh, Captain Fulton uh, with the Dragoons, he went up to New York and recruited another company and was bringing down, and he's writing in the letter as he's coming back to St. Augustine, there's been no significant deaths there. <laughs> Desertions or deaths uh, were worthy of remark, uh, which is a strange sa- statement <laughs> there, because it, it's said in a way that it's open that there were some but they weren't worth mentioning. <laughs> Classify whether someone was a significant death or not is a touchy subject considering the Trail of Tears. What can you tell us about the Seminoles' Trail of Tears to get to Oklahoma? Yes, there, there was a, a main chief. Um, his name was Halata Mathala, and he was one of the, the main Seminole chiefs during the negotiations shortly before they left, and he decided with his band and Charlie Amasola that they were going to remove. And of course, Charlie Amasola was killed by Osceola. Hawada Amasola, uh, he took uh, company, I guess he, he had about five or 700 people that he took out west with him. And he d- died shortly before arriving at Fort Gibson. So he didn't make the, the whole trip all the way. Uh, so it's very sad. I'm looking at the numbers. It said of uh, this first group, 407 and 87 died on the trail, which is about one fifth. And so he was one of those 87. And of course, it was rough for the army too. Uh, another record of bringing recruits or soldiers out to Fort Gibson shows that the three of them had died along the way. So I guess it was a long and hard journey for anybody. There was a uh, steamboat that the boiler blew up when it was uh, overloaded with uh, 600 of the Creek refugees and on the way to uh, Fort Gibson. And so that's a very tragic event that happened as well. The government had an obligation to supply the Indians, the Seminoles, as they were taken to Oklahoma. It also had treaty agents in Florida. One of these was a army officer, John Casey. John Casey was at Fort Brooke when Major Dade set out on his ill-fated march, and he was also in Florida for the Third Seminole War. Tell us more about John Casey. Right. Uh, John Casey, he spent a lot of time in Florida, and, well, one reason was he had tuberculosis, and the weather in Florida just seemed to be better for him. Um, And he survived for many years until he finally died in 1856. Anyway, he was at Fort Brook, and he actually learned some of the language that the Seminoles spoke. And I think in his notes, there's even a, I guess, a lexicon or a list of words that he had wrote down that uh, you can actually look the archive up on the Internet. And I had a fluent speaker look it over, and he said it's more like street language (laughs) from what he wrote down. Uh, So John Casey was very friendly, and it said that he always... Uh, uh, delivered what he promised the Seminoles and was always honest with them. So he was well-liked. He was a personal friend of Billy Bolake's. And when Dr. Whedon uh, took Osceola's stuff when Osceola died, it went to the military officer who was there at Fort Moultrie. His name was Pickaren Morrison, I think. Anyway, uh, from there, it the collection went up to the officer who was in charge of subsistence for Indian removal, 
Uh, there's actually a department called that, and that was to buy and provide the food rations for the Indians being removed. And that officer was a uh, Major John Hook. It's kind of interesting because he has connections to Major Dade and Florida, too. He was in the same regiment, the 4th Infantry Regiment, and he his name actually shows up on the Fort King or the Camp King, the first post returns, although he was up at, uh, I believe, at Fort Hawkins at the time. He gets injured, has a real bad back injury uh, that disables him. So he's given the desk job in charge of subsistence, uh, which he remains in that post the rest of his life. Major Hook, at the time that he's collecting uh, or that he's buying the food for the Indians, he's collecting a huge person collection of Native American art and artifacts. Now this would be considered uh, unethical <laughs> from <laughs> having this huge collection, but apparently Osceola's personal items were sent to Major Hook up in Washington, D.C. Uh, two years later, Major Hook, he dies probably from injuries of his broken back, and his wife has a big estate sale John Casey goes up there and supposedly buys the remaining items of Osceola that Major Hook had. And we don't know what happens to it from there. The items are listed in the newspaper articles of the Times, but they don't show up ever since afterwards. Casey returned to Florida. And so this is about 1840, 1842. Since he was such good friends with Billy Bowlegs, we like to think that he gave him the items back to the Seminoles, and they were returned to the Seminoles to be uh, honored with and, and taken care of with from there. So a subsistence officer like Casey might be involved in gift-giving with the Seminoles, and these gifts may have consisted of firearms. Well, the United States back in the early 19th century, it was common that they would give gifts to all the warriors and chiefs who showed up to the treaty talks. And so they manufactured thousands of rifles. And if you've ever heard of the Derringer, you know, the, the poker pistol that, that gamblers would have, uh, Derringer was in charge of manufacturing the Indian rifles from about 1816 to 1840. And he manufactured thousands of these rifles. They look similar to a, a Springfield, except they're much smaller caliber. And that, you know, not too many of them survived. And at first they were flintlock and then they were converted to percussion. Was well, one time researching as looking at the items of gifts that were given out to the Choctaw at the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. And there was an amendment or to that the list of gifts given out to the, uh, and this is dated two years later, and tacked on to the amendment was the gifts given out to the Seminoles for the Treaty of Payne's Landing. And that's because Congress just authorizes the spending for everything all at once. So it was just put in the same spending bill. And so it says that the Treaty of Payne's Landing that the Army gave out 2,200 Derringer rifles to the Seminoles, and this is uh, three years before the Second Seminole War began, so the United States basically armed the Seminoles for the next war. They were cheaper quality, uh, and they wouldn't sell as good on the open market, so they just used them for gifts to give to the Native Americans in the treaties. It's, you know, the technology was changing so fast at the time that the uh, flintlocks, a lot of them were being converted to percussion, and that would continue up until the Civil War. They were muzzleloader rifles and they, with rifling in the barrel, and I do have w one book that said the specifications of them, and they actually varied in, in caliber, too. The Army, of course, didn't think it was arming the Seminoles for war, but what did it think the Seminoles were going to use the rifles for? Well, for hunting to get their food and also that they could get deer skin to trade. Um, but back then it was considered a pretty essential item because, you know, you can't 
catch all your food on on wire and string and, and traps. It's just very difficult. So they figured a, the rifle was just a tool for hunting at the time, and it was to the United States showing that's not afraid to give that out as gifts. Uh, the United States says we're much stronger military power that we don't care if you have rifles or not. How much of an element of control was giving the Seminoles these rifles? Since they had percussion caps, the army or the government would have access to give the percussion caps for sale to the Seminole or not. Well, I found a letter and the letter is written by Wiley Thompson, the Indian agent, and he's complaining that some of the rifles given out need to be percussion cap so the Seminoles become dependent on the supply from the United States with all the supplies for their rifles. So the United States is trying to get the Seminoles uh, addicted to their supply chain. While the Seminole may have needed a resupply on percussion caps, the Army had its own problems with supply when it came to firewood. What was the story behind that? At the beginning of the Seminole War, um, General Jessup uh, is writing a letter as Jessup's the quartermaster. In fact, that's the way he is most of his career. And he's talking about having to expend ex extraordinary, uh, or extraordinary expense on firewood for the Army. You would think it wouldn't be a problem that you're fighting a war in a forest, an undeveloped area, that there should be plenty of trees. Well, the problem is, is they couldn't find anybody willing to cut down the wood because if they go in the forest to cut down the trees, they'd be attacked by the Seminoles. So at least the first series or the first year of the war, the army had to spend a lot of money just to get firewood shipped in from New Orleans. <laughs> so it seems like a straight thing to have items shipped in that should be in abundance where they're at. We say firewood, but they did need wood to build forts. Well, when they build the forts, they did cut down around the fort so they'd have a clear field of fire. But then they, after that, they would say, you know, no, no cutting firewood within a certain area after the fort's built uh, for whatever reason on that. And there's layers from Fort King that say that we are not supposed to be cutting any more wood around the fort. Uh, so they would have to go out and to another area outside the fort boundary and, and cut down the trees for that. Back to other areas that the Army needed supply for. While they gave Derringer rifles to the Seminole, there was a new rifle, the Hall's rifle, that it was trying to get to its troops going to Florida. Tell us about that, and tell us what the problems were with the Hall rifles. General Scott wrote a letter and gave 500 Hall's rifles to the South Carolina militia. Now, the government was trying to change the arms or rifles of the Army because the flintlock they're using is technology that had been in use for about 100 years, and they're ready to upgrade. So they were trying to upgrade to something different. The Hall's was one of those options. It was a breech-loading a rifle that you could load on horseback, but it hadn't been accepted. It would have to be accepted by a board of inquiry by the army, which would take a long time. And the manufacturer of halls came from Harper's Ferry, what's now West Virginia. Uh, to promote or sell those rifles, they would give some to officers or even some militia unit. Since they were available, that General Scott had those provided to the South Carolina militia that was coming down to Florida for the Seminole War. Now, the government also had to provide arms and gunpowder and shot to the various militia units and arsenals around the country. Uh, a lot of the arsenals would actually cast their own lead musket balls. They would have these about five or six-story towers that they would just drop the lead down a tube, and uh, supposedly the at the rate of falling down this tube, they would form into a perfect musket ball. Another of the militia units that used the halls was Jernigan's company in southwest Georgia around Stewart County, that they were also given the halls, but they didn't like them. They didn't like using them in the field. They said they're fine for garrison around the fort, but we take in the fields, they tend to break easier. If you're just holding them and not going anywhere, they don't break as easily, or the breach explodes. <laughs> Earlier, Chris, you talk about Seminoles who were leaders, and one 
who is going to Oklahoma. Where does Osceola fit in all this? How does he loom so large in this conflict? Osceola, he was not the hereditary chief or primary chief. He was considered a sub-chief or even, you know, just mainly a war leader. But, of course, he is a very strong character and got the attention in the press of the newspapers. And so he became a celebrity. The battles that we can actually see that he was involved in, the Battle of the Whistlecoochee, there was a, a fight at Fort, abandoned Fort Drain where he took up residence. And it's said that he was even at the Battle of Wahoo, but he was further down the line and not engaged in the battle. So most all the battles that we can actually trace them to are now around Marion, Alachua County, and not too far distance, which makes a lot of sense that if you're in a fighting mode that you also have to think of supplies and hiding out and feeding your army. Now, the soldiers fighting against the Seminoles, they didn't always win. Sometimes they were beaten by some of the Seminole chiefs and they didn't always know the name. But you want to put in your report, if you're beaten, you don't want to be beaten by a Seminole chief that nobody knows about, that no one would recognize the name. It also would look bad if you lost a battle. So the soldiers would credit Osceola for being at the head of the Seminoles. You know, if you want to be the losing side of the battle, there's just no way you're going to win. So you want to lose against the best, the Napoleon of the Seminoles, which was Osceola. So Osceola was given credit to a lot of battles that he was actually not at. And the soldiers, you know, were vindicated that there was no way they could have won if they had somebody brilliant like Osceola leading the Seminole charge. When you look at Osceola's contributions to the actual Second Seminole War, they take up about one-fifth, one-fourth of the time of the actual duration. And this was at the beginning. Right, just shy of two years. Uh, so in the seven years of the Second Seminole War, Osceola was only actually in the first two years uh, until he was captured under the flag of truce. And then four months later, he died at Fort Moultrie, South Carolina. After he was out of the picture, then it was Wildcat or Kawakachi who was looked at the main war leader. And so he's blamed at being everywhere, like even up in the Okefenokee Swamp and down in the Everglades and every place in between. But for him, it is actually mostly on the East Coast, south of St. Augustine. And Chris, I want our listeners to be reassured. All of these stories that you tell came from research, looking at microfilm, looking at sources online or in old record keeping books, as well as preserved diary entries. Right. What I do is I'd go in the microfilm on the adjutant letters, uh, trying to sometimes looking for a specific event or thing that I'm trying to research, like the Battle of uh, Gabriel Rains at Fort King. And sometimes it's not all there. It's not filed under Gabriel Rains' name. It might be filed under uh, uh, Colonel uh, Whistler, uh, William Whistler. Um, so I would have to not look under R for Rains, but W for Whistler. <laughs> So it takes a lot of sorting around through the records. All the letters on the adjutant letters are by date as they're received in the War Department in Washington, D.C. And so you have to look through some of these. And once you see a place or the name of somebody that you're looking for, then you can look through it. But along the way, looking for the letters, I'd come across some that sound really good and are really good stories. But you know, don't fit the research or story that I'm looking for, but are just so good that I would not want to miss. I had to save a copy like. Please give us an example of one specifically that you're thinking of right now. One of them, it's a story from 1841. There's a Private Walton who's with the 2nd Infantry, and this guy's a sad sack. If there ever was one, his uh, lieutenant who's commanding a Lieutenant Woodruff, he says that Private Walton requires constant efforts to try and make him learn a soldier, but he's incapable of doing any task. It says he constantly losing all of his clothes and equipment. The funniest part says during their drill and ceremony, he endangers the life of, lives of men in camp by loading his piece and discharging it through the camp. He said, an uh, occurrence last summer, he jeopardized the life of Lieutenant Canby, whose accidental rising from a chair saved his life there. <laughs> it says, you know, unfortunately, he's incapable of doing anything, and he's asking that 
Private Walton be discharged from the Army, says they won't even want to be on KP duty because everybody's afraid of getting a sickness if he doesn't, <laughs> since he doesn't wash good enough. So this is just one of the more interesting and amusing, but at the same time, it's kind of sad to I think I found out through other records looking through Ancestry that uh, Private Walton, he left the Army, but he actually did live to a, a good long life uh, up north somewhere. All this stuff I've found that makes interesting stories like uh, Private Walton or the men from Dade's command who missed the boat and weren't killed with Major Dade, uh, these are things that I find by accident. I'm just researching something and I run across them at the time. So it makes it more fun when I, <laughs> not going the uh, straightest route, I guess you might say, that I'm taking some of the side roads and come across these interesting stories of human history. Um, I found another one last night of a soldier who died. I think this was at Fort Jessup, Louisiana. And the captain was writing the family, said that for some reason, the soldier made the executor of his estate as a actor named Mr. Badger. <laughs> if that's a Charles Dickens type name, if I ever saw one of, uh, yeah, he says, I don't trust this guy. You know, yeah, it's just interesting stories like this. And, you know, and that's another one that I just found by accident. I was looking for something else of somebody of a similar name and found this in the same record group. Chris, thanks for a fascinating discussion about a whole bunch of things we had no idea about, but which are also fascinating and curious and rewarding to hear about. I really hope our listeners will feel rewarded from this episode since it provides the payoff to what we've learned about doing research. Chris Kimball, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us for The Seminole Wars, and please come back and see us again. Okay, let's get together sometime and, and talk about some interesting things. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted the Seminole Wars Foundation 2021. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Reedy Onman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.